All good. Hi, um, my name is Zach Patton. I'm with Cosmos Cluster 4, Computer Security and Cyber Villainy. And the subject of my presentation, even though it's not on my board, and I apologize for that, <laughs> is video game security. You don't even know your name, do you? Uh, it's on the back. Okay. <laughs> I'd also like to apologize for the lack of explanations of everything on here. I figured that for the most part I would be talking. So, first off, the question that most people would have when presented with this topic is probably, why should I care? For the most part, video games aren't considered imp important. They're just games. You know, something for blowing off steam. But if you think about it, there's a lot of money that goes into video games. Take World of Warcraft, for example. World of Warcraft has somewhere around 4 million users, I believe. <clears throat> yes, definitely. 4 million users. Each one of those has to pay $30 just to buy a copy of the game. And then another 14 per month on top of that. So if you've got 4 million users who have played for, say, a year on average, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and not to mention all the expansions you have to buy. So there's a lot of money that goes into these video games. And the fact that people are willing to spend this much just to play this game and to excel in it, there's obviously a lot that can be done to get money out of this system, legitimate or not. So I've organized my board into four columns with three base exceptions. The four columns are the different types of people who cheat in these games because when it comes to video game security a lot of the issues they aren't hacking in the traditional sense of the term it's cheating that is the problem because you have to be within the confines of the game to get what you want so the easiest way to start preventing is to figure out what their motivations are and there are four different types that I have up here there's the board gamer who is just you know they're not looking to get any money out of it. The enthusiast and the economist, they're a little more serious in terms of what they do to exploit the system. And then there's the griefer, who's not looking to get anything out of it, but is also the hardest to stop. And he's very important. The three rows I have, the type of gamer, the things they do to exploit the system, and what can be done to prevent. So let's start with the first one. The board gamer is just your average casual gamer who, let's say he's bought a game and he gets intensely bored with it. He feels he's been cheated out of that $30 he paid for this game. So much like a board of directors would, if they put all of their money and investments, they trust in this CEO to run a company that they're invested in, and this board of investors feels they haven't done a good enough job, they take the power out of that CEO's hands. And this is, that's exactly what these people do with the game developers. The most common thing that they do is called modding, which is modifying the game code. So it can do, you can give yourself godlike powers, or you can make enemies harder if you want. Now, keep in mind that a lot of games actually provide that legitimately. For example, Minecraft, I have a screenshot here. This is traditional Minecraft, which is a block-based game, you spawn in a world, you make your civilization. You have very primitive tools. In fact, the most combat tools you, that you can get are a bow and arrow and a sword. That may contrast with this image where the people up in the front can see it says sniper rifle on one of the items. That's one of the mods that is used. In fact, this one is called the SDK gun mod. And this is actually legitimate. In fact, Minecraft, the developer, Mojang, encourages this. However, there is something they don't encourage, and that's modding, especially on servers where it's considered a vanilla server, in other words, a non-modified server. If you're on a non-modified server and you've edited your client-side game so that you're flying around and you have infinite items, that might make a few of the other people on the server a little unhappy because you're getting a completely unfair advantage over them. And that's where this turns into something that actually has to be dealt with by the company. The most common methods of dealing with this by the company are A, 
you make modding legitimate, which is exactly what a lot of people do, and B, you check for moving wrongly. In fact, Minecraft has something on the server where if you stay in the air for too long, it'll give you an error message saying flying is not enabled on the server and kick you off. And you actually have an output here, which if you look closely, it gives a moved wrongly error. Now, the next sort of column we have, the enthusiast and the economist, and I've sort of tied these together into one, because while their motivations are slightly different, for the most part they use exactly the same techniques. The enthusiast is someone who wants to get ahead. They love the game so much, but they don't want to invest the time. So, they, you know, they want to get ahead, and it gives them an unfair advantage over other people. The economist is someone who's actually looking to get money out of the game. There are two common methods that these people use. First off, duping bugs. Bugs in the game are common with large, massive online games, because these, these servers have to contend with thousands of players at once. It's spread across many servers, but that's still like somewhere around a thousand people per server. And in getting updates between the game and all the different things that go on, it's very common for bugs to be encountered. One of them, the most popular, is called a duping bug. If you do something like you trade items with a friend, go through a portal, it forgets that you traded that item. So instantly you have it again in your inventory. Now this can be devastating. Let's say you have 64,000 coins in your inventory. Pardon? You tr give them all to a friend, then go through this portal and disconnect. You log back on, you've got two stacks of 64,000 coins. In games with an online economy, like World of Warcraft, it's absolutely staggering the amount of damage it can do. You can crash an online economy. And that online economy does have repercussions in the real world. In fact, many games, they actually do each unit of currency in the game has an equivalent monetary value in the real world. So if you crash that economy, that's a definite problem. The second type of attack that's usually used is called a bot. A bot is essentially, it's also called a macro. You write a program that plays the game for you. For example, if you, your character, let's say you want a lot of this one item, and this item is dropped by a single enemy in the game. This enemy respawns at a set amount of time, something like five minutes. So you would have to wait five minutes just to go and kill the enemy again. And you would have to wait and wait and wait, and time racks up. And you've got more important things to do with your time, but you still want all of these items. So you write a macro, or a bot, that says, okay, I will every five minutes run forward to lure this enemy and then kill it. And that's all the bot does. Every five minutes, it kills the monster for you and picks up the drops. You don't even have to be there. This, however, this gives you an unfair advantage over players who actually do spend the time. And it's their invested time, so it's not fair to them because you're getting ahead. This is one thing that game companies have to watch out for. And there are usually, there are three ways that game companies usually counter these macros. The first way, CAPTCHAs. I'm sure you're all familiar with CAPTCHAs. Um, it's computer generated images that actually have text in them and you have to enter the text. And it's very difficult for computers to recognize that text. So your bots can't automatically know what the CAPTCHAs are saying and enter. And some games will have this pop up every now and again in the middle of the game, and you have to enter it just to keep on playing. Unfortunately, this is a bit jarring. It doesn't really, it really contrasts with the game world. Think of it like you're reading a book, and then every five minutes your little brother pops in and asks what you're doing. It gets a bit tiring. So a lot of games actually take a variant of captures and introduce random events into the game. For example, has anyone in here ever played RuneScape? 
Yeah. All right, you, they're in RuneScape. You would be chopping down a tree, and all of a sudden a genie would pop out of nowhere and teleport you to a different realm where you'd have to solve a puzzle. And it would sort of fit in with the game because it was still, it was still fantasy, and you know, genies pop out of nowhere. It happens. <laughs> so it would fit in with the game, and it wouldn't contrast the experience, but a bot in that situation wouldn't know what the heck to do. It would keep trying to run forward while it was in the puzzle room. Run forward. There's no monster to aggro. Run forward, there's no monster to aggro. And eventually the game would say, okay, you're a bot, you're out. The third and final method of get, that most people use of getting rid of bots is a bit shady. And it's very much on the, you know, it's on the dark side of trying to stop bots. It's, companies call this legitimate spyware. And in fact, there's one company Blizzard, who makes World of Warcraft, who uses this mode quite a bit. They have a program called Warden. Now, Warden essentially scans all processes and windows open on your computer, and then sends the name of those processes and windows straight back to Blizzard. Blizzard then can go through them and decide if you're botting or not. If you've got a bot running, they can see the name of it. That's a major problem in terms of privacy. Because what if you've got your financial account open and you've named it something that is sensitive, like your credit card number or something? In fact, there's a quote from a book I read here. I watched the warden sniff down the email addresses of people I was communicating with on MSN, the URL of several websites I had open at the time, and the names of all my running programs, including those that were minimized during the toolbox. That's a major security issue there, and I think it speaks for itself. Now, the final category we have is called the griefer. The griefer is an interesting type of gamer in that he doesn't play the game in order to play the game. He plays the game to ruin the experience for other people. His main goal is to destroy and annoy. It's a lot common on Minecraft. I have an example here. Somebody's built a perfectly nice house, which somebody has come along with TNT and destroyed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, on servers, this is very common, and griefing is hard to... It's not something you can catch in the act. So in the three steps of prevention, detection, and recovery, you've only got the end two. There is no detection of griefers. Prevention, you can do. In fact, a lot of Minecraft mods do this on servers. You can protect areas for players. You can set a block of blocks to say, okay, only this player can edit in this block. So griefers can't come and destroy or build a shell around the house out of an indestructible block, which is useful. The other side of that is recovery. And most servers do this with rollback functions or with backups of the world. So if something, if a griefer happens to strike and burns down somebody's house, they can stop the server, remove the world, load it back on with the previous version, and then the house is back. And then you can blacklist that player and so they'll never come on again. The issue with that is anyone who made any progress during that time window, it's gone. Naturally, that's going to make your players a lot less angry, or a lot angrier. And because of this, you could potentially lose paying customers if they get angry enough. So that's why video game security is very important. And in fact, a lot of these ideas parallel to the real world. There are different versions of every one of these. And if you focus on computer your video game security and you pay attention to it, a lot of the techniques in this can be used to prevent hacking in the real systems. Thank you. Which one of the four categories are you in? <laughs> this one. <Okay. laughs> I use a mod called Technic Pack. Uh, any other? So I'm glad you mentioned real world. So, so, so if you can answer this question, you'll you'll be worth it. You'll be a billionaire. Okay. So, so um, you heard of Enron? 
Anybody, anybody who heard of Enron? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so um, in the real world, they played a game of doing bidding for power. Okay. And they promised to deliver power that they had no intentions of delivering, but to jack up the price. And they forced legitimate companies to then raise their price. And, and they, they, they bought some money, and we paid for it, or, or your parents paid for it. because We're still that, paying for what? it. I'm still paying for it, exactly. Surcharge on my PG&E bill yeah, every it month. It, it, yeah, it caused brownouts and like. Oh, yeah. so, so the key is, so okay, so here you're making a billion dollars. Any yeah. idea how to, how to detect this? Because it's gaming, right? It, 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 you, know, it, you know, bidding for power is a game. Right? Sure. So, uh, um, so. What? They got someone last week. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, how do they bid for power? They, they say, I, I'm gonna, I, I promise to deliver power to, um, to Woodland. Oh, okay, uh, in, in uh, at a certain rate. Okay, right. and then, and, and, and then they watch other people bid. And it's just like an auction almost. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they put out false bid. False bids. False bids. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You would have to have some way of guaranteeing that they can provide that power. And you would have to have some sort of certification, would be my guess. Certification? That's not bad. But, but guarantee, yeah, that's right. Yeah, guarantee that they actually can provide that power. Okay. Authenticate it. Yeah, okay. okay, all right. That would be my solution. <laughs> okay, it's not quite worth a billion dollars yet, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> have you read the book For the Wind by Cory Doctorow? I have not. It's a book that focuses on the virtual economies of the market. Interesting. Any other questions?